morning. My name is Tete Lauron. I'm come I come from the Philippines and I'm an advisor for the Rosa Luxembourg Stiftung. Hello, good morning from me. I'm Katya. I'm um, the senior advisor for um, climate, international climate politics at the Rosa Luxembourg Stiftung based in Berlin. You are both here at the COP26 now and you both have been on several other uh, climate negotiations before. So what is different this year? I think everything is different. We're holding this first ever in-person international conference in the middle of a pandemic. And that makes it very difficult for many countries, many voices, especially coming from the global south, to come to Glasgow and participate in the negotiations. So in the past, we've had a lot of issues around vaccine inequality and how many participants in the global south are still struggling to get their vaccines because of uh, a lot of um, inequities. No? The global north has um, practically hoarded the vaccine supplies available and not leaving much for the global south. There's also that issue around the unequal access because the rich countries will not allow the poor countries to develop and manufacture their own vaccines. So all of those things have all contributed to why there is such little presence of participants coming from the Global South in this uh, climate conference. And when you enter the venue, it feels like being on a business fair. So a lot of products are sold, like geoengineering is uh, the way forward. Also electric cars are highlighted. Um, I mean, we all know that these are four solutions and that they won't solve the climate crisis. So we hear a lot of hot air, I would say. People trying to advertise their new solutions, um, which are just old things in a new package. Um, but what we don't see are real solutions and higher ambitions. So it's really more like a showing off instead of a really get into and raise the ambition. Yeah, there are already very few people able to access these spaces. But then, you know, another problem that we have is that even if we are here in Glasgow, we cannot really access the negotiations because um, constituencies or the different NGO groups that are here are only given four tickets uh, to attend. So you have to split that among thousands of NGOs who managed to make it here in Glasgow and only four tickets per grouping. So that's about 32 tickets that are available for NGOs. So we are advised instead to uh, watch the negotiations from our hotel room, from our laptop. But even that is quite frustrating because number one, the system is crashing. You know, Even if we try to enter the um, COP26 um, platform, we are unable to do that because there's so many people logging into that system and definitely it's great getting choked up. And then I think number two would be, um, it's just the feeling that um, you're not welcome in this space. Even though we hear a lot of speeches about climate change being a global problem and everyone coming together to solve it, you don't feel that this COP is a very welcoming space at all. So there have been very high ambitions um, before this COP, especially raised by the British government. What do you think uh, are the most important issues to be debated uh, in these negotiations? There's actually a lot, no? because um, number one, we cannot deny that the scientific background or scientific evidence for how bad the situation is because we have the report coming out from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change a couple of months ago that said that we are way, way off track, uh, our goal of keeping or addressing climate change. Mm -hmm. And because of that, the impacts are expected to be you know, more intense, more frequent, and especially affecting communities coming from the Global South who are already facing a lot of these impacts. And uh, I think that's the number one on the agenda. How do you keep the hope alive? You know, that there is still something that we can do to address climate impacts. So number one, I think the British government wants to have that um, hope and optimism that this meeting will result to the global community coming together to fight climate change. Mm -hmm. And then there's still the problem with the finance. So right now what is happening is um, 
they are before we came here they were saying like we make sure that the 100 billion are on the table which were promised already 10 2009 in copenhagen and now what we saw is like in the beginning at the very first day they thought okay maybe we reach that goal by 2023 even though uh, they should have reached it in this year actually last year 2020 2020 yeah. so now it seems that they might have that amount together by 2022 so next year but still right now they're trying to also use that kind of money for their mitigation so in order to become net zero um, and this is not what this money is should be used for it should be used for lesson damage it should be used for adaptation and it's way too little mm -hmm. so after this first week of negotiations what are the three most important points that you take away from from this first week um, it doesn't feel like it's really an intergovernmental negotiations no? throughout week one we've been hearing a lot of small announcements coming from everybody from governments from corporations so it makes me think now this is the un it's supposed to be an intergovernmental space negotiating those outcomes but why is it that there seems to be you know like 100 different announcements coming from everywhere but when you put it all together it doesn't quite add up to the big picture you know the one big announcement that would really make a big difference in this climate space and maybe another thing that happens is that it feels we're going back so instead of proceeding also with the language it seems that a lot of issues are now excluded from the text like human rights is now in brackets, for instance, in Article 6, and do things we already decided partly on, that, for instance, gender issues are more present in the Paris Agreement and Rubok, but now it seems that they're cutting them out again. So that's one of those things I think. Yeah. So finance is also one big issue that we are um, getting a lot of mixed signals in these negotiations. No? Um, according to this UN convention, climate finance is a responsibility of the rich countries towards the poor countries you know, for uh, addressing the impacts of the climate change. But what I hear in the negotiation space is that rich countries are really, really hesitant mm -hmm. you know, to uh, put money on the table because they say that they also have you know, climate vulnerabilities domestically and that they would rather see a lot of the money spent for uh, the transitioning to a low carbon economy. Well, that's all fine, you know, mitigation is fine, but the UN says there should be a balance between mitigation and adaptation. That is so not happening yet. And yesterday at the climate finance negotiations, it was really a little bit ironic that you have a draft decision text that somehow is quite decent, you know, in terms of um, trying to put forward progressive language for an outcome. But it is now the rich countries who are really up on their toes trying to demolish whatever progressive language uh, there is. For instance, um, a proposal that rich countries double up the money that they give for adaptation, they're so not liking yeah. it, no? Of course not. <laughs> they're so not liking it. And they're also totally refusing to have a dedicated funding facility for losses and damages. Because for rich countries, that would be somehow admitting that they are responsible and that they should pay up. So we are not seeing a lot of commitments specifically for loss and damage finance. Although last week there was a mini announcement from the Scottish government that they are going to allocate one million pounds uh, for losses and damages in developing countries. But we're not seeing other countries follow that path. There have also been um, many events around the COP, not just in the negotiations. Can you say a bit what happened outside the closed space here? There are the real discussions, I would say. So there's the real action. We were um, very lucky to join the Global Climate Action Day where um, they organized a march here in Glasgow as well. So it, the Global uh, Climate Action Day was worldwide, quite decentralized, uh, organized. But here in Glasgow, there was a huge march. I think 150,000 people joined that march. We were there with our banner and we demand for climate justice. 
um, and to step in for a, so really take over responsibility and uh, come up with the finance, come up with all the things that are needed in order to uh, make the climate crisis less hit. Um, and this was really powerful. Mm -hmm. There are also a lot of very interesting events happening outside this COP space. And I think what I really like about uh, this space as organized by the COP26 coalition is that we try to understand what is happening here in the negotiation, but also the political implications of all of these uh, blah blah discussions. No? And uh, uh, here the experiences, the lived realities of frontline communities already addressing or facing the worst impacts of the climate change and what they are doing to organize and build power from the ground because that is the only way that we can ever hope to have a, you know, the real solutions that really matter for people on the ground. And maybe one more thing, what, what um, our international delegation was quite uh, fond of and I really love that they supported this is it the strikes of the Clancy workers here in Glasgow? So uh, we went to the uh, strike line in the morning and uh, we're supporting their action. And I think it's really good to see that people here in Glasgow are also very um, aware of where the mistakes and the injustice lies. So um, it's good to see that solidarity. Yeah. So what do we expect from week two? Well, you see this lanyard that uh, is on our IDs right now. Actually, we just came from a civil society action this morning calling out, you know, those uh, governments, those member states who are trying to or who have removed, you know, any reference to human rights, the necessity of human rights in climate action. So we think that is really, really stupid. <laughs> we think that it's not the way to go. So we are trying to step up our campaign for week two because now negotiations are heating up. You know, all governments are working so hard late into the night, into the morning, just trying to produce the outcome documents from this COP. But um, for us, what is important is they keep these principles, human rights principles alive because if climate action is not guided by human rights, then it would not mean anything. Then it would mean more harm and more displacement for people already, you know, suffering from the impacts. So we try to step up our advocacy. This is just the first of the many actions that we are doing here. We're also trying to talk to more governments, not uh, trying to convince them why it's important for them to speak up and defend you know, the interests of our people in the communities of developing countries and for the rich country delegations, we are also trying to convince them why they should do the right things. I think that's <laughs> really good. Like, um, okay, last question. If you would be named now, right in this moment, the president of this COP, what would you do? You want to go first? Mm. Yeah, of course. I um um if I would if I would be in that position, um, then I would try to really push hard on the global north in order to step up to their responsibilities and put on the table um, all this money that is needed and not in form of loans, credits, or any kind of um, money that would create further debts um, for for countries that aren't able to cover what, what is needed for the losses and damages they receive and already have. So um, I would go for the finance part, mm -hmm. definitely, and really urge and push them hard. Nice. Okay, if I were the COP president, I would do three things. Number one, I would um, gavel, announce that we are establishing a dedicated facility for loss and damage that would really help communities you know repair rebuild from all the damages of uh, climate change number two i would say i would um, call for governments and corporations to really make those commitments not just empty pledges not for real zero emissions not net zero because the climate crisis is not an offsetting or a balancing thing we need to push for real zero solutions 